Hello, welcome and a very good evening to a small little video on which I didn't plan, but I think it might be interesting. I got myself a new monitor, a new very old monitor. It's the Commodore DM602. It's a green screen monochrome monitor, which I got from the same guy who gave me the VIC-20. Um, it was not really tested because he didn't have any um, video leads, but when I got uh, another donation from someone who gave away his old 60 C64 collection, um, there was this video cable in there, and um, it actually fits to the C64 and the VIC-20, which is a good thing, and I could test this monitor, and it works, luckily enough. The VIC-20 broke down I need to repair it, but that is a very small repair. Only one ROM chip is broken. Um, maybe I will make a video about that, maybe not. I'm not sure it's interesting enough. But this thing here is pretty interesting. I have two monitor cables like these. Um, one is already in use with the other C64. And the C64 actually has um, kind of an S-video output, which gives pretty good quality but these monitors don't take as video, so um, I used the composite lead, which gave a weird grainy look. We will have a look at that later. Um, this is due to the fact that the color information is in there and the monochrome monitor doesn't know what to do with that, and you get weird dots, let's say that. But again, we will look at that in detail later. Um, this here is uh, basically the S-video cable, on yellow you have the only the luminance, so the brightness information. On red you get the uh, chroma, the color information. And both together give you the color picture. But the monochrome monitor will only need the um, luminance information and it also comp contains the, the composite sync signal. So you only need one plug to actually drive this monitor, which gives a much cleaner output. We will compare both the composite and the chroma, uh, the luminance only cable later to see the difference, which is quite obvious. And the white is audio, obviously. Um, and this thing also has a built-in speaker, which is nice, so we can watch this. So what is the advantage of the green monitor? Well, the black and white or green monitors had a higher resolution because there is no shadow mask on the back side of the glass. There's only the glass and the phosphor coating and you have basically very high resolution, no artificial dots or pixels. Well, they are not actually pixels, but they are picture dots, uh, which limit the resolution of the tube. Um, in theory, if you focus the electron beam very tightly, you can have very high resolution on those kinds of monitors. Plus it looks very retro style, like the matrix effect with the green characters running down the screen. This is actually pretty fast phosphor, so um, it doesn't flicker really in person. On video maybe it does, but in person it's very stable, very nice looking, very sharp, very bright. Um, it has a very good picture quality actually. Uh, yeah, so that's the advantage. However, this thing is of course, again, 35 years old or so, I would guess. Uh, maybe we'll find out when we open this. But it has one problem, the video input here is loose. I think it broke, maybe when it was here at my place, or maybe before, I'm not sure. Definitely the solar joints probably gave way after multiple decades. So we will open this up, solder the socket, and then close it up again and compare the two video outputs with my old C64 bread bin. And then we have a nice monitor. The only disadvantage of this monitor is that I think it was stored not very well. well. It was stored pretty well, but there's one little scratch right in the center, which is usually happening if you store it against some, some hard surface and you can get scratches in the, in the glass. You can probably fix that somehow, but it's not that noticeable and, and I'm not too much concerned about it and don't want to break anything by doing much to this thing. It's fine as it is. Luckily, the power switch still works fine. It's not jammed or even mostly they, they go bad by, you can push them in, but they won't stay in and they are hard to come by. So yeah, 
I will turn this around, open up the whole thing, and then we'll do some soldering and also short visual inspection if everything looks okay. So, and a very small tour of the monitor for those of you who have never seen the insides of a CRT, which is becoming more and more likely because these things are not manufactured anymore. Uh, the principle of such a monitor should be known, hopefully, um, but I'll explain it once more again. This here is the picture tube. It's a vacuum tube, basically, which uh, is having some kind of wire back here, which is heated, and the heated wire expels electrons. The electrons are then guided by magnetic fields, created by these coils and some adjustment magnets here uh, to scan over the surface of the front of the picture tube, basically. And the front is coated with phosphor, which lights up when it's being hit by electrons. So this part here at the back is called the neck board, and it basically drives the electron gun and all the um, wires coming out here um, for the yeah, I don't know, for all the, all the coils and stuff. So this assembly here drives everything. Then we have this red wire, which is the anode of the picture tube. And I'm not gonna touch this because this can still contain a few kilovolts of yeah, voltage. Um, it is driven or it is controlled by this black thing here, which is the flyback transformer because all the electrons will try to, um, yeah, will fly to the front of the tube and they have to be discharged basically from the tube, which is uh, done by the flyback transformer at a very high frequency. Um, these things tend to break over time. I hope that this one will last quite some time because they are not standardized. Every monitor has a different one, basically. Um, the board down here is basically the, the whole video section and it's pretty simple compared to some of the others. Uh, there are a lot of capacitors, especially one very large one and some Y class or whatever filtering capacitors, I guess. A lot of stuff is not populated here. Maybe for a different revision of this monitor, there were versions that were for IBM PC compatibles from Commodore and similar things. Um, the picture tube itself is from Philips. There were a couple of manufacturers like Samsung, Philips, and a bunch of others. Um, LG, I think, was in there as well. But they're not made anymore. Um, actually, here in Aachen, we had a picture tube plant, I think, by Philips, but they closed it down quite a number of years back. Yeah. Um, also, there's the big transformer for the mains input. I'm not gonna touch that either. Not sure if anything of this is still charged. I can go over this with a compressed air gun maybe to clean up a little bit. There's one fuse I can see, um, which obviously doesn't need replacement because the monitor still works. But I think that's more or less it. There are some controls back here for the picture. Um, most of the important controls, the brightness and volume are on the front but the uh, picture size you can control with these um, from the back, actually. Yeah, so that all looks good. Um, I'm gonna heat up the uh, soldering iron. The flyback transformer output pins are sometimes as well a problem. I'm not gonna touch these, don't fix anything that's not broken, but I will reflow in the sockets just to make sure that um, this will work just fine.
monitor works, it is running, and the C64 is running, and you can perhaps see that it looks pretty sharp. I can try and zoom in a little bit and maybe you can see the nice scan lines, but almost no artifacts. There's a little bit of jail barring, that means there are vertical lines, which is typical for the C64, so that's sort of expected. And yeah, uh, let us see if we can um, figure out a way to zoom in. So I hope YouTube is not butchering this too much with its compression, but I think you can see here that the screen is really, really sharp. So let's try and load up the demo that is on the disk here. Let's load up Natural Wonders 2, uh, because it has some nice graphics. And then we can see what the monitor is capable of. And then we will compare with the other, with the composite cable, and see hopefully a pretty significant difference. On the left you see the Luma only signal and on the right you see the composite signal. And as you can see, the composite signal has discernible dots which are from the color information in the signal. And if we take the Luma only without the chroma information from the other cable, it looks much better actually. Of course it's hard to record the same thing twice with the same settings on the iPhone camera. But I think you can see here that yeah, um, the dithering effect is especially bad on text. So I definitely think I will be sticking to the Luma only solution. Even though the dot pattern has some nice effects on the graphics actually. So the nice little DM602 Commodore green monitor is working again. It was working before obviously, but uh, it was definitely a good idea to fix that broken composite port or video in port. And uh, yeah, it's a tiny bit annoying that the pad ripped off there, but I think we built enough solder around that so that it will work for a while. Now let's hope that none of the capacitors or the flyback transformer fails. And um, actually this is then a very nice and very clear and sharp monitor for the C64 Breadbin and the 1541. I will probably also use it with the VIC-20 um, because I think there are some things on the VIC-20 that are fun to play. And the palette of the VIC-20 is pretty naughty, let's say. Reminds a bit of the ZX Spectrum. So having a monopro monitor is actually not that bad a thing. And some games look much nicer on a green screen, I think. So this will probably be the setup, um, the 1541 or something similar with the VIC-20 and this monitor. And I can swap out the VIC-20 for the 64 Breadbin if I want to play some different games and stuff like that. Yeah, but um, whenever you see something like this, definitely take a look. Um, they are very nice screens indeed. And I found it very interesting that the um, composite signal versus the Luma signal makes such a huge difference actually, because I've never thought about that before. And you don't see that on the color monitors, but only on the black and white screens, obviously. And I wonder if that was also a problem with color television on black and white TVs. I'm not sure. Maybe some older folks can remember who had a black and white television at home. If the picture looked more grainy than let's say on the color TV, I don't remember that. I remember that my grandfather used to have a black and white screen TV and I didn't at least notice that it looked grainy because back then it was already, of course, all color television. But that being said, um, I'm happy to have this. It will serve a very good purpose here and I hope to see you soon. Share, like and subscribe as usual. Uh, links to Patreon and Ko-Fi are down below in the video description. And yeah, see you next time.